Welcome back to another episode of Off the Bench, Northern Arizona Prep Sports, presented by Rice Accounting and Jackson Hewitt Tax Services, Cottonwood Parks and Recreation, and Gettles High Desert Mechanical. I'm your host, Philip Catafamo. We have got a great show in store for you this week. Later in the program, we'll be joined by Bob Weir to talk wrestling and rodeo. We'll discuss his time coaching wrestling at Camp Verde High School, uh, his new role broadcasting the sport at Yavapai Broadcasting, and how he became interested in rodeo clowning. We'll then be joined by Bradshaw Mountain Girls soccer coach John Sterling. He'll discuss his plans on how he's going to replace last season's senior class, preview the upcoming season, and speak about the team's first game against Dysert on November 30th. But on the other side of this break, we'll be joined by Bradshaw Mountain Boys golf coach Dave Kapka to talk about how his team performed at state and who he's excited to get back next season. All of that and a whole lot more coming up right here on Off the Bench. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Starting in the late 1920s, Grandpa Gettle and his brothers laid the groundwork for what would become a family legacy. Almost 100 years and 100 patents later, Gettle's High Desert Mechanical continues to raise the bar of quality heating, cooling, and plumbing products and services in the Verde Valley. Call Gettle's High Desert Mechanical Heating, Air Conditioning, and Plumbing at 567-2200 or online at gettleshdm.com. Providing solutions for your comfort. Don't settle. Get Gettle's. Welcome back to Off the Bench, Northern Arizona Prep Sports, presented by Rice Accounting and Jackson Hewitt Tax Services and Cottonwood Parks and Recreation. I am joined now by Bradshaw Mountain High School boys golf coach Dave Kapka. Coach Kapka, welcome back onto the show. I appreciate you having me. Good seeing you again. Well, it's good to have you as well, Coach. You were kind of one of our early guests in the very early iterations of the show uh, last October. So uh, a year later, we're touching base here, talking about some golf. The golf season has wrapped up. For um uh for Division Two fall golf um and uh the Bears obviously participating here uh, Coach Kapka just kind of in general you know how did the season go for for your team this year? You know we made a, a lot of uh, improvement over last year. We had a young squad. Uh, we had one junior, which was uh, Andrew Reynolds. Uh, he did compete in state. We'll talk about that here in a moment. Mm -hmm. uh, the rest are basically uh, uh, freshmen and soph sophomores. Um, we had Andrew or, uh, Andrew's little brother, Jeremy, who, uh, played pretty well for us. He kind of fluctuated between our number two and number three, and, uh, he finished off strong. He, uh, again, made great strides. Uh, he's basically where Andrew was when Andrew was a freshman. So we look, uh, forward to Jeremy, uh, growing. He's also a, uh, a dual athlete. Uh, he, he plays, uh, baseball in the spring. So he's getting ready for baseball now uh also we had uh brody jewett brody uh is coming from uh vermont he's a, a transfer he's been in the area for a couple of years uh but um he also was one he's a sophomore that uh showed great improvements and came on strong again at the end of the year and he will be uh, a big part of the program the next couple of years obviously but uh, I think between um, those two, Jeremy and Brody, uh, being so young, uh, it makes for a, a solid future for the golf program. And again, uh, with Andrew being a junior this year, another year with, with Andrew. Um, but uh, we had Evan Anderson, fresh, or he's actually a sophomore as well. His first year playing, he actually did a great job for someone that hadn't played the game before, picking it up and uh, – played in quite a few of our matches and he hung in there again, being a young guy that very little experience other than probably putt putt, mm -hmm. but uh, he worked hard and, and got better. Uh, we had a uh, Gavin trustee, Justin Berry um, were from last year's squad. 
that uh, competed and they also uh, improved. And again, them being sophomores this year did show improvement from last year. So we're growing, you know, the, the growing pains of a young squad with very little experience. So uh, we competed in a few matches, but, you know, being so young, they, they got to see what golf was all about, you know, when we played against teams like Prescott, Lee Williams, and a few of the others. Well, Coach, it seems like you're pretty optimistic going into next season. Obviously, you'll get your top golfer and Andrew Reynolds back. You mentioned his little brother, Jeremy, is on the squad playing well. Uh, you, you mentioned, uh, obviously, uh, outside of the one kid who's really new to the sport, it seems like some of these kids do come in with some experience uh, and, and really performed well for you. Um, you're Like I mentioned, you'll be coming back with basically the same squad uh, this year uh, and going into next year. We'll talk a little more about that. Uh, but, Coach, let's talk about Andrew. He was the lone representative at State this season. Uh, how did he perform? Uh, he did pretty well. He had a few issues on day one. Uh after six, I believe, uh, six holes, he was, I believe, one over and was doing really well. But then I think uh, the course itself, we were at the Tucson National Course, which is a beautiful course and was pretty tough. Um, it started getting to him a little bit. He was having a tough time on the greens, but uh, he ended up 11 over on day one. And then on day two, he, of course, figured it out. Usually the kids after seeing the, the course, a new course, they figure things out and uh, he was only five over second round. So he ended up finished 36th in the state out of, uh, I believe, 78 golfers. So mid pack, which is very good for yeah. someone that, you know, first year uh, at, at the state level, seeing that kind of co competition. Well, and that gives you somebody with experience, of course, going into next year. Andrew will be a senior. He will be uh, it, from judging off what we just talked about. He will be your lone senior next season. Uh, and, and you're right. He's got some state experience now. Uh, finishing 36 out of 78 is great, especially for a first-time state uh, qualifier. Um, Coach, I just want to get a little bit more into the state itself. I mean, how much input are you giving to Andrew during competition, or is it just kind of, you know, you're giving him as much advice leading up to it, and then from there it's all it's, it's on him? You know, it is on him. We technically, as a coach, we can uh, talk to the players, you know, on the fairways. Uh, we have to obviously stay off the greens and off of the tee boxes. And, um, but I'm one of those that don't like to do too much coaching once they're out there. You don't want to throw too much into their brains while they're trying to get things figured out. Obviously, if you see something, you want to talk to them about it. But Andrew is one of those that uh, he's uh, a student of the game. He, he just is so in depth with what he's doing, what he needs to work on. After each shot, he kind of analyzes it himself where he knows what he did wrong, what he needs to work on. And he needs very little coaching, uh, you know, off the side. He's just uh, very competitive. And so he's uh, one that needs very little coaching. Uh, so it was kind of nice just kind of cruise along in the cart and watch him do his thing. Yeah. Uh, let, let's talk a little bit about Andrew's development. I mean, obviously, uh, he is a junior this year. He'll be going into his senior year. We talked a little off air. He does have some plans to go possibly play golf at the uh, collegiate level. Uh, nothing definitive right now, but he's at least thinking about the next level. Uh, but but how has his game grown since he stepped into or he stepped onto the course for the first time for the Bears? I mean, what strides has he made not only this season but the seasons before? You know, he's cut his uh, strokes down by about five since last season alone, um, and that just comes with off-season work. Um, he probably gets out three four times a week in the off-season. Uh, working on his game. Um, again, he's a student of the game. He, uh, he watches a lot of video. He works with his grandfather who, uh, is a avid golfer himself. Uh, his father was also a big time golfer. So it's in his blood per se. And he just, again, he does what it takes to, to get better. And he just has that attitude to where he doesn't let a bad hole get to him. And that's something that it's hard to teach, you know, it's just innate in an individual. And he, uh, he doesn't let a bad hole get to him. And that's a great thing when it comes to, the, you know, the game of golf. Well, especially uh, in, in the game of golf and those individual uh, individualized sports where, you know, you kind of look at a basketball team or a football team. And, and, you know, if you have a, you know, if you have a weaker quarterback, but have a good running back, you can kind of make up for the, the slack there. But in an individual sport, obviously it's on you. If, if you're not on your game at state for golf, that's it. 
Uh, it's it's right. you're going to finish how you're going to finish. But it's nice to hear that Andrew uh, not only comes in with a lot of previous experience. You mentioned he's got family ties. Obviously, his brother's going to be playing as well or has been playing this season. So the kid's obviously well in depth with golf. He comes in with a lot of experience, has, has provided experience uh, as well to, to the other players. Can we talk a little bit about how he's operated as a leader on the team? Right. Yeah, he he's one of those where when we're out on the range, he'll go out there and work with the, the other players. And if he sees something, he he'll stop his game to go work with the, the younger kids. And, um, you know, the kids love him for that, that uh, he's willing to to work with the others um, anywhere. <laughs> he can help. Andrew is, is one of those that um, he just loves being out there and he just wants everyone to be successful and he does what it takes. And it's just nice. He's like an assistant coach for me because again, if he sees a swing on one of the, the younger guys that he sees, you know, a little mechanical issue, he'll go up there and start talking to him if I'm working with someone else. So it, it's really nice. Oh, I, I bet coach. I mean, like you said, having that extension of yourself of having a secondary, you know, quote unquote assistant coach or a player coach, not necessarily with the title, but uh, it's great to hear that your, your upperclassman is, is, you know, doing what an upperclassman should do, which is be a mentor, uh, you know, be a role model uh, and step in when needed. Again, we're speaking with Bradshaw Mountain High School boys golf coach Dave Kapka. Uh, the Bears just wrapped up their season for Division Two fall golf uh, earlier uh, uh, this month or later this month. Uh, but anyway, uh, coach, you know, kind of looking forward on the season. You mentioned you had a new golfer coming into the program. Uh, how do you approach a new golfer? I mean, how, how do you kind of uh, assess where – uh, uh, where some of those things need to be, where, you know, where some of those trouble areas are, how do you approach teaching the game to a new golfer? Well, you just got to see, you know, what his background is. You got to see what he's doing on the range, how he handles himself on the course itself. You know, does he have the course management skills? Does he, you know, know what club to hit, what situation and so forth, and just kind of go from there um, and just let things play out as to, you know, what kind of background he has just by, you know, see how he approaches the game and then um, see what kind of work he needs from that point. Now, coach, obviously you're going to be getting back uh, essentially your entire team minus some guys who either, you know, just don't want to play or, or don't end up coming up right. for golf. But for right now on paper, coach, you're looking like you're returning your entire squad, uh, not to mention, you know, of course, some freshmen who might be coming up next season uh, or maybe even some kids who didn't play golf last year who were interested in it this year. Um, but I'm curious, now that we're entering the offseason, uh, what is your game plan here? I mean, what is the focus right now for the offseason? How are you continuing to grow this program? Well, you just got to let the kids know that uh, you can't put the clubs up once the season's over and think that you can pick it back up, you know, once, you know, next year comes around. You, you've got to spend the time in the offseason to, uh, you know, work on your game, get out there, swing the clubs when you can. And um, we've tried in the past to get something together uh, with the Prescott Country Club, which is our home course. And it's just hard to get these kids out there to uh, spend the time on the course in the off season. Now, of course, you know, you got Andrew, you got Jeremy, you got uh, Brody, who already said they, they're going to make that commitment um, as well as I guess Evan as well. He's even said that 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 is going to be a, a big bonus. And in the past, yeah, I've had a few kids that are willing to work in the off season, but uh, I think this upcoming season, we're going to see the benefits of those that have said they're going to commit to the off season of uh, uh, working on their own because, you know, I also uh, will be coaching softball. So, oh. you know, it's going to be hard for me to get out there with them uh, in, in the off season. So they're going to have to make the commitment on their own. Uh, well, Coach, congratulations on the, the uh, new program you're, you're taking over for the, the softball team. Or, or uh, are you the head coach? Are you assisting? Uh, where, where's the role? It'll be the head coaching of the girls' okay. softball, yes. Well, congratulations, Coach. That That's oh, awesome. You. So I'm, I'm, I'm great. We'll get an opportunity to talk some softball with you then when we get closer to the season. Sure. Um, uh, but look, getting back here to to golf again, uh, speaking with Bradshaw Mountain High School boys golf coach Dave Kapka, the Bears wrapped up their state playoff uh, – excuse me, their state playoff competition – on October 28th, uh, as we're getting ready here for the offseason. Coach, you talk about you're getting a couple uh, guys who are committed to the offseason. Obviously, you'll get some returners. How are you approaching recruiting? And I, I, I use recruiting very loosely because you can't recruit yeah. in, in where we're at. But uh, how are you attracting more kids out to, to golf? 
Well, again, the recruiting, you know, again, that term you try to stay away from, but you just got to go with um, the kids that are currently on the, on the team and let them know, Hey, you know, you need to go out there and talk to your buddies, see if anyone is interested. I know we have a few kids that know how to play the game and are pretty good golfers. Um, I know of one that uh, probably could be my number two behind Andrew and possibly could have qualified for state that was a freshman this year, but he was on the uh, mountain biking club. Ah. And it's kind of funny. He's in my first hour computer science class and uh, I've been speaking with him, but you know, mountain biking is going on at the same time as golf. So he chose this year to do the mountain biking, which is, you know, great, but um, we're trying to work something out where possibly next year he could do both at the same time because of, you know, the way practices work and so forth and, and the meets and what have you. So you just got to be creative as far as some of those athletes that are possibly playing two sports, you know, I'm sure there's some uh, guys that are on the football team that love to play golf and are decent golfers, but that probably wouldn't work out. So as far as that, it's just a matter of current players that are on the team, just going out there and talking to their buddies and see if anyone might be interested and send out uh, uh, announcements, letting people know, Hey, if you're interested in golf, you know, see coach cap and so forth and kind of go from there. Yeah, you're going to definitely be battling uh, Coach Young for some of his football players potentially, and uh, we'll, we'll see how that one goes. That's a tough one there, yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, you know, again, we're speaking with Bradshaw Mountain High School boys golf coach Dave Kafka. Coach, uh, I just want to say congratulations on finishing the season. Uh, I know last year we talked a little bit, and obviously, you know, the pandemic provided a lot of uh, a lot of issues uh, for, for everybody last year. But this year, I'm, I'm happy to hear that you are able to get a state qualifier. Hopefully, you'll get some more kids out to per- participate in golf as well as softball. Congratulations on taking over the softball team. Uh, like I mentioned, we'll, we'll have to talk before the softball season starts uh, just to preview that. So we'll, we'll, we'll touch sure. on that when we get closer to there. But uh, coach, congratulations on finishing the season. As always, it's great speaking with you. I love the stash and uh, I, I can't wait to see more of it here soon. I appreciate it. Thanks for the time. Anytime. Take we're going to we're gonna take a quick break. When we come back, we'll be talking some wrestling and rodeo with Bob Weir right here on Off the Bench. Stay with us. Two things we can count on every year. A new set of tax rules and great weather here in northern Arizona. Jackson Hewitt Tax Service, locally owned and operated by Lewis Rice since 1997, is here for you all year long. Your neighborhood Jackson Hewitt Tax Office will help you in all of your taxing situations. Electronic filing is always free with your tax preparation at Jackson Hewitt Tax Service. Get more in return. Call 1-800-234-1040 for an office near you. Welcome back to Off the Bench, Northern Arizona Prep Sports, presented by Rice Accounting and Jackson Hewitt Tax Services and Gettles High Desert Mechanical. I'm joined now by VACT Superintendent Bob Weir. Mr. Weir, how are you doing, sir? Doing great. Thank you again for having us on. Well, always happy to have you on. We've had you on our other program, Countywide, multiple times. Thought we'd bring you on to Off the Bench because you do have an extensive connection to not only wrestling here in the Verde Valley, but rodeo as well. Um, so before we get into your wrestling connection, as we're getting closer to the wrestling season, I thought we'd talk a little bit about rodeo in the Verde Valley. Obviously, uh, here and amongst Yavapai County, uh, and, and probably you can extend that even further through the state of Arizona, there is a prominent wrestling, or excuse me, a prominent rodeo culture culture here uh, that I've never been a part of because I'm from Southern California, and the closest thing we get to horses is driving past a random farm. But, uh, you know, rodeo is huge in, the, in Yavapai County and throughout the state of Arizona. So I just kind of wanted to ask, you know, uh, how did you get involved with it? And uh, what, you know, what about rodeo piqued your interest? Well, I grew up around it. My grandpa was a pro rodeo stock contractor, so he had all the horses and bulls. And so didn't really have a choice to do something in it. Uh, don't really care to ride horses. Uh, <laughs> our, you know, I tried to ride bulls and horse, bear backs, and that wasn't very good. 
So I started clown when I was 13 years old, uh, you know, figured out was guaranteed money when I go to a rodeo, get paid and been doing that now for 40 years. Uh, right now I'm just a rodeo clown and barrelman. I do the, get in the barrel during the bull ride and I don't do the bull fighting as much. And I do all the acts and comedy, uh, which that led us into doing the rodeos here for 16 years. We did the Fort Birdie Days Bull Bash at Cliff Castle Casino. And when I was a wrestling coach, that was our major fundraiser. And so with the rodeo background, I knew all the different people to bring up. And so it turned into a great fundraiser, made anywhere between ten and $15,000 a year for several years there. Yeah, that's a, huge yeah, that's a lot of money to go travel and do things in off-season wrestling, plus pay for hotels and meals and stuff like that. So our kids weren't out any money at all during the season. Yeah. Uh, you, you talk a little bit about clowning. Obviously, uh, you are what would be considered a rodeo clown. Uh, what, what kind of you, – you, obviously, you said, you know, not necessarily the bull guy, not necessarily the horseback guy, but you have found a, a, an interest in now almost like a secondary career. Of course, you're the superintendent over at V Act, uh, which we'll talk about that at the way end of the interview. But you know, why why clowning? I, I mean, what what kind of got you interested in that? What got you started in that? Well, like I said, I grew up around it, and so I got to be around all the old pro clowns, and so I was kind of a neat deal. I fought bulls up until I had my daughter when she was uh, born. So I did about 10 years of fighting bulls and then been in the barrel before that prior to 18, my dad would let me fight bulls till I was 18. And once I turned 18 and I fought bulls till about 26, 27. And then I've been a barrel one since then. It's fun. You get to entertain the crowd, uh, you know, get to have a lot of fun doing that, doing the acts and jokes and things. And, and then it's pretty good rush in the barrel. You get knocked around pretty hard in there. And sometimes you can't do nothing besides sit there and let them throw you around in there, but it is fun. It's a way of going it. My wife runs barrels and my daughter ropes and all, and, so, you know, they're still involved. Uh, we're part of the Camp Verde Arena Association. We help build that arena, and we put on two rodeos a year, the one in June, the one that just recently got done, Fort Verde Days, and I've clowned that one. And then we have the Turquoise Pro Rodeo Circuit Finals coming uh, November 4th and 5th, or 5th and 6th. Okay, I'm going to try to mark that down here so we can talk about that before we get done. But, uh, yeah, interesting. It seems like uh, a rodeoing has is, is definitely kind of been in the family. Obviously, you talked about your, your past with it. Now your daughter's incorporated in it. Your wife is incorporated in it as well. Um, you know, do you have any kind of favorite stories, uh, your time clown? And I know you're, you're still doing it, but do you have any kind of uh, any stories that sort of jump out to you as, as maybe some fun ones and then maybe some, some more adventurous ones? Oh, yeah. It, it depends. I was in Apache Junction one time and I was doing a clown act and uh, a lady came out of the crowd uh, during the act and tried to be part of it. That was, she was a little bit on something and it was quite entertaining because we tried to go on with the crowd and she was kind of in and around, you know, be appropriate with her, but it was, it was entertaining. And then, you know, it just depends. A few years ago, we did the bull bash there at the casino and a young kid, uh, used to actually be a past wrestler at, uh, Wickenburg high school, uh, was starting to fight bulls and the bull, I just got me a new barrel and the bull hit it and come around, stuck his whole head in there and picked it up and down on me with me inside there. And, you don't go anywhere. You just sit there and glad he didn't have horns and hit you too bad. But, you know, kind of fun. The poor kid goes, he felt so bad. And he goes, I didn't know what to do besides lay on it. And I said, well, I didn't get to see anything besides his nose. So, but, uh, you know, it's just fun things like that. You get to go a lot of places. Uh, as your rodeos all over southwestern United States. So you get to meet a lot of people. Uh, a lot of rodeos I've done year after year. So they become your kind of second family. And it's just a, it's a neat group. Yeah, no, very much so. Uh, and it's, it's got to be a neat group if you guys are dressing up like clowns and, and hanging around a bunch of bulls. I mean, it, that in itself is a, is a dangerous activity. But can you tell me a little bit more about sort of the, you know, what you kind of do specifically on, uh, uh, while you're, you're clowning? You talk about being in a barrel. You talk about your time fighting bulls. I mean, can we get a little bit more specific as to sort of the, the routine of a rodeo clown? Well, you're, you know, you're there to fill in the dead spots. Uh, you don't want to overtake the announcer. So you you know, like when between events, when there's a dead time, when the people are walking from one end of the ring to the other, you, you know, you tell jokes, you go up in the crowd. I'm a big one on getting in the crowd and, you know, high fiving kids and taking pictures with them. And you know, I always was taught, you know, if you, if a kid likes it, they'll bring mom and dad back the second night. Yeah. And uh, so I get up there and do that, uh, do quite a few acts in there. I got a clown car that rides wheelies and, uh, you know, a lot of fireworks on it. And I got a new car I just been using recently that splits in half. Oh, okay. so put, uh, the other clown in the back dressed like a woman and uh, we're going to go get married. And when it's all done, I say, take it off and I pull a, a, a lever and it cuts the back half off and it flips them off, you know, up and they jump out. And then I drive around in the front part and scoop around and they jump on up on the hood and I end up taking them out on the front hood of it. So yeah, it, it's fun. Just things like that. A lot of slapstick comedy, you know, it's uh, it's different. A lot of the, I consider myself an old school clown. Uh, I just got back from a rodeo clown reunion in first of August. 
uh, where some of these guys were 80, 90 years old, and they were the original ones that started back when the barrels were wooden and tires around them and a lot, a lot more things now. But, uh, you know, it's just it's neat to hear their stories and try to continue what they built. Uh, the new guys just want to tell stories and throw T-shirts out and dance, and that's not my style of clowning. So it's a little different. Yeah, I guess you kind of have to split that difference between being – you know, the entertainment part of the clown and then kind of being uh, essentially like a cheerleader, I guess, is, you know, is what I'm getting from it. You know, you, you have your aspect of it, which is more of the crowd work, more of the hands on, more of the jokes and, and sort of the, the tomfoolery of being a clown. And then it seems like uh, uh, people are more interested in the dancing part. So uh, it seems like there's a, there's a lot of, of uh, a different sort of uh, ways to take clowning a, a, as a rodeo uh, or as, as a rodeo clown. Yeah, it is, you know, and then when the bull riding starts, if there's a bad wreck, I still do get out and help if I have to. I'm the older I get, the less I'm involved about getting out unless I have to. But in the old days, when I first started, you were the only one you did acts, you clowned, you out feed, you were the only bullfighter. So if there was a bad deal, it was you. And yeah. now almost every rodeo has two bullfighters, if not three. So the barrelman doesn't have to do as much. You know, you bring it in, you're a safety zone. Uh, you bring it in when the bull's still bucking or so the cowboy can run behind you or the bullfighter. So, you know, and then you get hit instead of them. And so it's, it, you know, got that serious part of it too. Yeah. And well, it's of course, safety first is for, for anything. I mean, when you're dealing with animals like that, you know, a bull or even a horse or, or even if you're getting in the mutton busting, I mean, you could still have that, that element of, of danger when you're dealing with a live animal, who's just kind of like in the moment living just in that moment, not sure really what's going on too much, but, uh, yeah, safety, of course, being a, a big factor, um, you know, talking more about that preparation time, obviously there's acts and routines that you guys are working out. You talked about sort of the safety issue as well. There's probably a lot of safety protocols, a lot of safety measures you guys have to go through to ensure that not only the clowns are safe, but also that the riders are safe and the animals are safe. So how much preparation and how much sort of rehearsal time do you guys put in each week or, or maybe each month, or, you know, maybe it's, it's, it's just a couple weeks before, before the event starts, but we just talk a little bit about that preparation time as you're, as you're getting ready. Uh, yeah, you, I mean, you do it quite a bit. I, you know, constantly working on my cars, uh, you know, they're, they're homemade, a lot of them. So they break down, but uh, that I had to be federally certified for my explosives. Uh, once nine 11 happened, you couldn't buy the squibs or the things we uh, set our fireworks and explosives off with. So I had to be federally certified. So that every three years, I got to keep that up. And then, you know, when I was fighting bulls, I was a lot better shape than now. So I used to work out a lot more than I do nowadays. But, uh, you know, and then when you get to the rodeo, you work with whoever you work with, the bullfighters. So you do some pre-planning on them, getting them to do what you want. You work with the announcer on your acts on when they say things and certain stuff. So, you know, it's a lot of ad lib, but there is quite a bit of pre-setup to a lot of it. Can you take us into sort of the atmosphere on a, on a rodeo night, just kind of what it's like to be around those fans? And, and if you can give us kind of any idea of, of what it's like to be down, you know, in the ring while these events are going on with, with the crowd just around you. Oh, it's, it's exciting. You know, the other day at Fort Verde days, I mean, we had a packed house standing room only and, you know, that's, it's always a good crowd. They enjoy it. So, you know, you go some places are a little harder to work. Depends where you're at. Sometimes they're not there, but a lot of rodeos you go to, you know, people come to have fun. And if you're, I always tell them if, if I'm having fun and laughing then somebody else eventually will, uh, you know, have to have fun too. So it, it's exciting. It, it's a good, it's an adrenaline rush for sure. Uh, you know, it, it's just like anything, people do it because of that, a lot of stuff. So it is adrenaline and, you know, when things go well, your act does good or something like that. It's, it's, uh, you know, it's a good, a good feeling when people are laughing and, you know, people leave and say how much fun they had. That's, that's, that's why it's all about. Again, we were speaking with VAC superintendent, Bob Weir. Bob is also very involved in wrestling here in the Verde Valley. We're going to talk about that in just a second, but he's also, uh, involved in rodeo here in the Verde Valley and Yavapai County as a rodeo clown. Uh, before I move into the wrestling, just real quick, Bob, if somebody was interested in being a being a part of this, being a clown or just being a part of rodeo in general, uh, where would they go? How would they get started? Who should they speak with? Uh, you know, just just maybe more in general, maybe not specifically here, but just, you know, how would you get started uh, in that profession of rodeo? Well, a lot of it's just to see what you got around your local area that do is like we open our arena up, uh, you know, four times a week there in Camp Verde. We don't have any rough stock all the time. It, it's just during the rodeos. But Get with somebody. A lot of the bars down in Phoenix, they have the bull ride now, and that's kind of where people go practice. They used to have them at people's houses, but with the insurance and liability, a lot of them there. So like Roadrunner there off of New River, they have uh, every Wednesday and Friday, they have practice sessions plus open bull riding. And so that would be one there. And also just check around your local community. There's always somebody in the community, even in California, that rodeo. And, uh, you know, that would be one way of doing it. Uh, Camp Verde Arena Association. So it's campverdearena.com. There's a list of events there always. And, uh, you know, then a lot of stuff is just 
you know, kind of go around. Prescott has a bunch of rodeos all the time. And so, you know, go to one and just start talking to people. But if you want to ride bulls, best is probably go to the bars. You can be under 18 to ride in them. You don't have to be 21 or anything. So that's where a lot of our kids go practice. Okay. Interesting. I, I, I was, I didn't even think about to ask you sort of the, uh, the difference between a, you know, well, not necessarily a real bull and, and the mechanical one, but just sort of where the mechanical one kind of plays in, in practice. And, and that's interesting that the guys will go down there and, you know, jump into a bar or a restaurant that happens to have the, the mechanical bull. And, oh, no, and, no. And these, these are, these are live bulls. Oh, these, these are, oh, these are live bulls. Oh, oh, okay. Okay. All right. Yeah, I got they you. have an arena. They have an arena built outside where they actually buck live bulls. And that's part of the bar atmosphere. To a certain extent. Gotcha. There are a couple of mechanic, mechanic ones are all right. It's good practice, but the new ones are more for entertainment. Right. They're, they're wider. They're not normally like a bull. And so they different rigging, different hand holes and stuff. So a little different, but yeah, it, the mechanic ones are not fun. I've been on a few and, and when they really ride them up, you, you a lot of times will break some knuckles and fingers coming off of them. So I've gotten tossed off a couple uh, mechanical bulls in my time as well. So, uh, you know, I, I, that's where my expertise with rodeo is going to start and end because I am not at any point. My, my dad and I used to watch rodeo on TV all the time. Uh, and, and as a little kid, I always thought it was real cool, but, uh, you know, getting a little older and a little bit more kind of aware of the dangers, uh, I'm not necessarily uh, going to be hopping on a bull anytime soon, but a mechanical bull around a bunch of, uh, of uh, uh, styrofoam or, or safety area. Sure. Why not? But uh, again, uh, uh, coach, we we've, we've, we talked about rodeo, your time as a clown as well. Um, you were also very prominent uh, in the wrestling scene here at uh, in the Verde Valley and in Yavapai County throughout the state of Arizona, 23 years at Camp Verde, helping out their wrestling program. Um, I, I just want to talk to you a little bit about just how you've seen wrestling grow in the Verde Valley, uh, not only as a coach, but now kind of stepping away from the sport uh, with, with some rumors that you might be coming back, but we'll leave them at that. But, uh, you know, uh, you've, you're, you're now a broadcaster. You, you help us out with the broadcast here on, Yavapa, uh, on, on Verde Valley TV uh, uh, with wrestling. So I just want to ask, you know, in your 23 years and now stepping away, how have you seen wrestling sort of grow in the Verde Valley? Is there a program that you look to as sort of the gold standard? Is there one that you see that might be up and coming? Uh, just, just what have you observed? Well, you know, I started 23 years ago. Camp Verde had a wrestling program that was really good. I took over for a coach who had been there for pretty much the inception of it. And, uh, you know, we had, we had won a few. They'd been top three in state. And Amigas at that time was growing. Tom Bocash was the coach. And it was growing. Um, you know, we started a lot of weekend programs. And I do see the state of Arizona. I grew up in Colorado. So wrestling was a, a way different level than it was here. Uh, a lot, lot tougher, a lot, lot more things in Arizona. Arizona's come a long ways, and I would match them right now with Colorado, with uh, Kansas, with some of the Midwest teams, Iowa, you know, even back east. We took some kids back to a national tournament. Some of our kids, our first year we won state. And, uh, you know, the level back there is a lot different, uh, you know, back east, and, and they're a little different. But we, we hung our own with them. And I believe a lot of that's contributed to the weekend of wrestling, you know, uh, full year-round wrestling, even though other kids play sports other sports but just coming in during the summer and off season and practicing and then open up the gyms uh we used to do weekend wars at camp verde now mingus is running those uh my assistant coach that was under me has moved over at mingus uh, mario chigoya doing a great job but uh you know that was what i saw was we were pretty proud because we won state our first year and, and there was not a transplant all of them were kids that came through our system from kindergarten up and they were some of our product of youth wrestling to junior high to the club and then into ours and at that time mingus was uh you know us and mingus went back and forth for a long time and when i first started coaching i used to come over here and practice with them because we didn't really have a good room and tom let us in and then once we started winning uh we didn't get invited as much but uh <laughs> just great rivalries you know uh, they won state a few times we won we had uh, six state champions uh, when i was there and three three runner up uh, they won state the year after i retired and uh it's been going good you know you always have sunny side huge, uh, you know, I don't know how many state champions. Uh, I was, I really tried to take our program after Payson, uh, Dennis Perch, long time, uh, hall of fame coach. They had won 11 state champions and come from a small town. And, and he took pride in those were all his kids from growing up where sunny side, you get a lot of kids moving in and out. It's, it's a factory. Uh, so I, I do believe that the Verde Valley wrestling was very well known for a long time. It, it's coming back. I mean, this is programs really growing back again. Clinton King's done a great job, uh, put a good set of coaches together. Camp Verde's has kind of dipped down a little bit, uh, was bringing back. Uh, we've lost our coach there. Uh, Larry Allred, he's going to be a part-time coach, but not full-time head coach. Uh, he works full-time and had some issues with uh, 
one of my past wrestlers that got the bad car wreck was in a coma, was helping him coach. Uh, he's out of it, but you know, coaching. So they're going to have coaching change. No, I'm not, uh, I go back and coach. I will. I told them I'd help them with their home meets and stuff, but uh, I just don't have the time right now to for what it takes to be a, a build a program. No, of course. Uh, and and you know you dedicated so much time to the area, and and it's great to have you here with with us because you're a wealth of knowledge when it comes to wrestling, and and you add so much more to the broadcast than I do because I, when I call wrestling, I, I I've got I, I don't have 23 years plus of experience with with wrestling, so I'm I'm still learning a lot more about the sport. But when you get a chance to go behind the mic, it, it's it's nice to hear those you know, that expertise come through, uh, on our broadcast on Verde Valley TV. Uh, but, but Bob, before we let you go, just real quick, what's going on around VAC? Do you guys have anything going on? Uh, anything coming up that anyone should know about? Well, you know, we're, uh, we're right in the middle of our school year. Uh, we'll be starting registration coming up in January for uh, next school year. Uh, we started some new programs this year, HVAC heating, cooling at the college. We have EMT, which is going very, uh, very well. Some actually past uh, students of mine, uh, fire science. One of my ex-wrestlers is doing that. And our construction, our law enforcement, uh, our nursing programs are doing very well. Uh, Colony Art. So great relationship we have by college. Uh, all the three high schools feed to us along with the charter and homeschool. So just get involved, viac.com. Uh, great place to do that. We will start January registering for the following year. We do register kids at semester. So we will have some some of my programs. I can take new kids at semester construction and nursing. So that's good. And then right now we're starting to compete in the contest. Uh, our HOSA, which is the Health Occupational Student Club, and our Skills USA, which is construction and law, and our Ed Rising. They're all going to fall leadership camps and getting that that uh, you know that extra leadership skill, which to me I think makes a well-rounded student. Well, Bob, we are, I appreciate you coming on and talking about your time as rodeo clown, and and also just as your time uh, here, kind of building up wrestling in the Verde Valley. Uh, I, I thank you very much for taking the time, sir. It's always great to speak with you. And I look forward to uh, hearing you back behind the mic on Verde Valley TV when we get wrestling season started up. All right. Sounds good. Hey, thank you. Thank you. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we'll be joined by Bradshaw Mountain Girls soccer coach, John Sterling, right here on Off the Bench. Stay with us. Starting in the late 1920s, Grandpa Gettle and his brothers laid the groundwork for what would become a family legacy. Almost 100 years and 100 patents later, Gettle's High Desert Mechanical continues to raise the bar of quality heating, cooling, and plumbing products and services in the Verde Valley. Call Gettle's High Desert Mechanical Heating, Air Conditioning, and Plumbing at 567-2200 or online at gettleshdm.com. Providing solutions for your comfort. Don't settle. Get Gettle's. Two things we can count on every year. A new set of tax rules and great weather here in northern Arizona. Jackson Hewitt Tax Service, locally owned and operated by Lewis Rice since 1997, is here for you all year long. Your neighborhood Jackson Hewitt Tax Office will help you in all of your taxing situations. Electronic filing is always free with your tax preparation at Jackson Hewitt Tax Service. Get more in return. Call 1-800-234-1040 for an office near you. Welcome back to Off the Bench, Northern Arizona Prep Sports, presented by Rice Accounting and Jackson Hewitt Tax Services and Cottonwood Parks and Recreation. I am joined now by Bradshaw Mountain High School girls soccer coach, John Sterling. Coach Sterling, welcome on to the program. Thank you, sir. Glad to be back. Well, happy to have you back, coach. Um, you know, last season, the Bears finished 2020 with a 4-6-1 and record. Uh, obviously, a lot to talk about there considering a COVID year. Uh, but coming into this season, a lot of optimism, a lot of... Uh, a lot of excitement, but coach, let's take a step back. How did you feel about that 2020 season in a, uh, as a whole? If I never have to go through that again, <laughs> it will be too soon. Uh, you know, on top of COVID, we had, I think we had five, four or five, five season ending injuries amongst our starting uh, 11. So that, that really put a damper on our season. Jeez. Yeah, and I would assume so. I mean, uh, obviously, like you said, Coach, you've already got the, the COVID restrictions, having to wear masks, having to make sure people stay socially distanced during that entire time, and then navigating five season-ending injuries. I mean, I, I'll, let's jump off from there, Coach. I mean, how were you able to sort of navigate not only the COVID restrictions, but also losing potentially a couple leading scorers or some good defenders? At five season-ending injuries is huge. Yeah, yeah, it was uh, – and it – it was mostly at the beginning of the season. That was the problem. It was, you know, 
by the time we got to region, we were, we were pretty much done. Um, it, it, our only hope and our only choice was um, we were running limited crews anyway, because there were kids who didn't show up because of COVID. And we ended up just combining the squads at about uh, halfway through or two thirds of the way through the season. So we pulled up a lot of JV players and, and there were several players that got varsity level experience real quick. And that was all, all we could do, you know, at that point. Um, numbers were low anyway, and it was, was all we could really do. It was, it was not fun. Well, and of course the benefit of that could be very much getting those JV players, some of that varsity experience early on, of course, coming under horrible circumstances, but nonetheless, I mean, you're welcoming in some new players from the JV team last season, coming into this season. Um, you did graduate two seniors last year, uh, Alyssa Berry and Haley Denman. Uh, can we talk about their contributions last season? Um, Haley was one of those injuries. So, um, <laughs> she, she did something to her knee early on. So, um, to have a D one player who, um, she's at New Mexico state now, I believe, <laughs> um, leave your lineup and, and, and give, she gave us such a huge contribution as a sophomore. She didn't play as a junior and to lose that as a senior, that, that really hurt. Um, Alyssa though, Alyssa finally became the player that we wanted her to be. Um, she stepped up into the leadership role and really, really powered through the season and, and, and rallied the team as best she could, um, around the, you know, the injuries and, and everything, but, uh, you know, those, you always miss those seniors and, and because of the leadership, but you just, it's the nature of the job. You, you build some more and, and they come back and you build new ones. So, um, it, we're going to be interesting to see who steps up into that role this year. You know, Coach, uh, congrats to Haley Denman if she is playing over at New Mexico State. Uh, as a Grand Canyon University lope, I, I will say I'm a little upset the Aggies are picking up some good talent. But uh, uh, nonetheless, it's always great to see some of these kids playing at the next level. You talk yeah. about welcoming in some new players next season. Uh, you've got a potential huge senior class this year. I counted eight juniors on the roster last season. I know not everybody will, will make the return back. But, uh, I mean, how are you feeling – for those who do come back this year, uh, how are you feeling about having that much experience coming back on the roster? You know, this is the best day of the season to ask me that question because it's the first day. <laughs> um, you can't replace that experience. It's great to have, even if they've never played as a varsity player and they make it, you keep them as a junior and, and you leave them, let that leadership, hopefully they lead at the JV level. And then by the time they get to you, Maybe they don't step into a leadership role, but they definitely know what it takes to be there and, and, and do the job. So um, senior leadership is, is valuable. Um, and, and we have a couple right now who are still out on injury because they, the nature of the injuries, they, they won't be back for a little while into the season. And, you know, those girls are leaders as well. And, and, they, they lead by just being there and, and I, those girls will be out um, and they will be there and, and, and they will be helping. So um, yeah, you can't, you can't deny that, that senior mentality because it's over for them. It, this is it. And, and they tell everybody um, cause we'll have our first meeting today and, and they'll tell everybody, those seniors will tell everybody you're a freshman and you think that you've got a long time to trust me. It's over for us. And we thought the same thing. So yeah. Um, you know, they, they do a great job at that. Well, and that's good too, coach. I mean, you've got that leadership on the field coming into this season, welcoming in some of those new kids who might be playing soccer for the first time, or definitely playing high school soccer for the first time. Uh, and it's nice to have maybe that extension on the field from you to have those leaders there who, who, like you said, they know what the deal is. I mean, they, they, they've been there, they know what's going on. They know what's expected of you. You know what you expect from them. And uh, they, they present an opportunity to just sort of welcome in that new group of kids uh, as an extension of the coaching staff. Right. And, you know, they, they really are. Um, and, and we tell them that, you know, you guys as, as seniors, as uh, especially the girls that are, are in the leadership that are maybe a captain or an ambassador in the program. And, you know, we tell them you're, you're part of the leadership. You, you set the example right along with us and, and they, they, they take that because of the things we've done and, and the things we do with them. And we put them through leadership courses with the NFHS and things like that. And um, they take that responsibility very seriously. So 
it's, it's good that they do that. And um, they're committed to being those leaders and, and it's, it's, it's invaluable. It's invaluable to have that, you know, I can sit down and, and be comfortable in the fact that when the game starts, they have, I don't have to worry about it. And that's, that's what it, the way it should be. Yeah, no, I, I definitely. And I've, and I've heard that ring through a, a couple of the, the coaches and, and most of the programs I've spoken to, which is very much, they rely on that senior leadership. It's nice to have some of those pit, those, those players who are, are fully aware of what's going on and, and, and can provide a, a little bit of that extension from the coaching staff. But again, we're speaking with Brad Shaw Mountain High School girls soccer coach, John Sterling. Uh, the Bears will start their 2021 season on the road at Dysert. We'll talk with uh, Coach Sterling about that here in just a little bit. Uh, but Coach, uh, you do return your leading scorer, uh, Brittany Gittens. She comes back this season. She is now a junior. She was a sophomore last year, had seven goals on the season. Uh, how do you plan to further her development this year as she enters uh, her third year uh, at Bradshaw? Um, it's Bethany, so... Um, oh, well, no, what yeah, did I say? She, uh, you said Brittany. Oh, great. And it says Bethany on my notes, too. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Sorry, Bethany G- uh, Bethany Gittens. Excuse me. <laughs> Let me correct okay. that. Her name is Bethany, not Brittany. I'm sorry, Coach. It's still early. It's Monday, Coach. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. And I... Hey, and you know what? I got girls. So it's okay. Um, you know, we're going to probably deploy her in a, in a, in a forward, uh, forward position this year, a more forward position and try and get her the ball. Cause she's a, um, she's a big, strong physical girl. So, um, she spends a lot of time in the weight room on her own, um, working out. And I saw her just the other day and, she, she looks ready to go. She has, there's something that happens between sophomore year and junior year, and you can see the fire in their eyes. It's, it's that realization that, um, yeah, I am down to a short amount of time now. And, um, so we're going to, we're going to, we're going to try and feed her the ball more, push her up front, um, get her some opportunities, get somebody that can feed her the ball. That's going to be the key and, and get her to, to, to better battle off those, those, uh, those big defenders and get her to uh, move a little more up top and get her to take quicker shots from a further distance. I think I want to see her shoot from a little further out instead of trying to pound that ball down in. I want to see her turn and just snap that ball right now. So, um, and hit the corners if we can. Gotcha. Uh, You had a freshman goalie last season in Zeta Paulino. She comes back in her sophomore year this year. Um, uh, Coach, what goals do you have for her this season? Um, the first goal is to get her healthy and get her back in the, in the net and back in the game. She, uh, she received a head injury and I don't remember when it was It's a light concussion, June, July, it was July, I think. And she was just about cleared to come back and train and she was in a car wreck and she was injured pretty bad. Um, physically she was okay, but it was another head injury. They were, they were hit and somebody ran a light, hit them from the side and her head hit the window and she's been suffering concussion symptoms since late July, early August. And it's now starting to clear up. So um, we're hoping to get her back um, at all. Um, I'm hoping that, that she gets receives full medical clearance and, and we can at least start to um, get her some tr- training because I'm not going to push her right back out there. I don't, I don't want to risk it. That's, that's not why I'm here. So um I'm, you know, wins are important, but not at the, the cost of somebody's head and their health. So um, the first goal is just to get her healthy and then get her back into some light training and see how she does. And um, we'll go from there. Um, short of that, um, I'm just, I need to work with her as soon as I get getting the footwork down and the movement in the box and things like that, because honestly, the girl's a beast. She has no fear. She has, she came off the field multiple times last year, um, just in a lot of pain because she throw her body at things, and, um, you know, landing on her hips and things like that. And so we need to just get her back into the game and probably teach her a little bit softer game. So she's not so hard. So she doesn't go in so hard on things and, and, and stare a shot in the face or a foot in the face or something. So um, probably going to have to train her to play a little bit differently. Um, not so aggressive. Aggression is, is good. It's easier to back kids down than it is to crank them up. So hope 
hopefully we can back her down and get her to think a little more and play a little smarter. Well, that's going to be interesting in her development coach. I mean, you've got, obviously you just said it, she's got a fiery passion to play the position and she comes in with a lot of experience. She was the, uh, one of the varsity goalies last season you had to, uh, but this year Zeta's kind of, it's going to be stepping into that role. And, and like you said, just to continue her development and sort of even around a little bit. I mean, she's only a sophomore. I mean, if, if you're successful this season right. and really kind of working on her, yeah. her conservative approach, I mean, coach next season, even the year after she's going to be, probably leaving the, the 4A in, in goal or in saves, excuse me. I, I would hope so. Yeah. yeah. I would, I would, I would hope so. Um, and she has that potential. She's that she's, she's pretty good. She's pretty good out there. So yeah. Um, we just got to temper that aggression with that conservative approach and we'll figure it out. We always do. Oh yeah. Again, we were speaking with Bradshaw Mountain high school girls, soccer coach, John Sterling. Again, the bears kick off their 2021 season on the road at Dysert on November 30th. Coach, we've talked about a lot of players. Is there anybody else that you're excited to see come back out on the field for this season? Um, you know, I got a couple of freshmen. Um, okay. Well, that were freshmen that are sophomores now. Um, this is kind of the year that that really defines them as players, and we'll, we'll see if they develop. Um, because, um, like I say, it's that junior year where they come in with the fire, but this is the year where we can light that fire. Um, Charlize, um, and I'm going to mess her last name up. Um, Angolia, I believe is how she says it. Um, real dynamic player. Um, we just need to get her to, to be, uh, a more, uh, again, a smarter player and play and play the high school game instead of the club game. Um, cause there is a difference and I need her to be a little more, uh, a forward of a forward playing player, get out of that defensive mindset and, and push them forwards a little more and, and get up there. Um, the other one I'm really excited to see is Maya Corral, who got a broken ankle and was out for the rest of the season last year. She was one of my season ending injuries and it was in the first, second, third game of the year. Mm-hmm. So um, she earned a starting spot as a, as an, as an outside midfielder last year and, and really excited to see her back. Cause she's a, she's a box to box player. She'll play the, the entire width of the length of the field and, and just really excited to how um, excited to see how the injury affected her and if she's going to have that same um, willingness to get in there and get on the ball and, and, and fight for it and everything. Um, may take a little bit to get her back into that because she's not the biggest player out there. By, so we'll just see. Um, out Alvarez, everybody uh, knows that knows our team, knows little Emily. She's probably one of the best players we've ever had that plays in like a sixth uh, defensive midfielder position. Right. She's just a smart player, fit as a fiddle, and just she just very smart, does everything right all the time. Um, this is her senior year. Um, she's gotten some looks from some schools. I've gotten some calls, so we'll see. Um, but the three of them and, and Emily, um, yeah, with Emily in there, I uh, – She's going to be exciting to watch this year because I give them a preseason assessment and I ask them what they want to do this year. And one of the things she said is I want to get forwards more and I want to shoot. So nice. if she can add that to her game, she'll, uh, she'll help us a lot. Uh, Coach, uh, last season, the JV team was able to accomplish two games on the season. Um, you mentioned it early on. You had a lot of injury problems in 2020. So bringing up a lot of those JV players um, this season, however, how is the JV team looking? Are you looking at a more normal JV program this season? Uh, just, just give me an update on the, on the lower levels. Where are we at with that? Yeah, we're going to be, uh, we actually, I've got the, the list up here on the side. So if you ask me names, I can kind of talk about them. We have actually 44 players on our, our list to try out this afternoon. Awesome. Um, that that's the most we've had in a long, long time. And I don't know why it is. I think people are willing or looking to get back from COVID and it's, you know, they want to get back out there. And I think, you know, last year we were depressed because of COVID. And I think a lot of people are trying to find something to do. Um, so yeah, it's going to be a normal year. I don't, I haven't seen any of them this fall anywhere other than the weight room. Um, I know they've been doing indoor with one of my coaches on Wednesday. Um, I've got some good feedback on it, but I have not been in any of those sessions. I handle the weight room part of it. Um, she's probably my, my JV coaches is, is could have as many as 20 JV players on that roster over there. Wow. So um, that's an awesome thing for us because that means that going 
forward, we'll have players. And if we get time with them and we can get them in off season programs, then that will help us a lot. Um, but knowing the level of talent in there, you know, there are players who have been in there for two, three years and, and will still be in there and they're good players. Um, unless we pull them up to the varsity squad, we just have to see, we'll figure that out in the next two or three, four days. But, right. um, yeah, it's going to be more of a normal year for us. Um, and, and those players will get plenty of playing time and, and they'll actually be a team. You know, last year, a lot of the varsity programs continued, but the JV programs didn't because, you know, they'd have half a squad leave because they didn't want to be out there because of COVID. So they'd combine them like we did. So, um, so yeah, we, we should see a, hopefully a more normal season. Well, coach, I'm, I'm feeling good about a normal season as well. A lot of the programs I have spoken to have welcomed in uh, a lot of new players. Like you said, I, I'm a huge fan of, just kids getting out there and playing in general. So it's, it's nice to hear that you you're welcoming in more kids. I know you feel the same. You're shaking your head, uh, but it's, mm-hmm. it's great to see more kids out participating in any sport here in Northern Arizona or just in general uh, coach. Before we let you go, I do want to ask you about uh, the game on November 30th, first game of the season on the road at Dysert. Uh, how are you feeling about that one? Um, I'll tell you in about two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> I know we're a little early, but you know, I, I thought I'd ask you, you know, right now, yeah, you know, um, we got a good group, core group, and if, if we can get that core group um, back and healthy and everybody's playing by that time, we have a couple that won't be back. You know, Aurora Corona, ACL, she won't probably be back until January if we get her get to see her at all, and if we do, we're not going to see her much. I'm not going to put her through a lot, of, um, a lot of work at that point in time. It's going to be, you know, give her five minutes on the field when she can't hurt herself, so – um, hopefully we get Bria Coleman back um, by then um, has a sprained LCL. Um, but short of that, we still have 13, 14 players on the squad. Um, and if we have a goalkeeper, um, you know, five years, um, it's when we get into region that we, um, because every game in the, in the region is like a rivalry game because all the coaches know each other, all the players know each other and everybody wants to beat the snot out of each other. So, um, those games are, are tough, but, um, you know, Dicer, we've played them in the past, you know, again, those, those, those out of region games are, are, are where we, we, uh, cut our teeth and, and, you know, they're where we practice at basically, you know, figure out what we have to do for, the region games and figure out all of the pieces where they fit. So, uh, but I think we'll be good against the Dysert and Deer Valley and, and um, the other teams that we're playing early on. We have been in the last three or four years. So I would expect that trend to continue. Well, you're right, coach. This is a very tight region, of course, currently controlled by uh, your crosstown rivals, the Prescott Badgers, coach Paul Campuzano. We know he's going to be coming out with a great squad. Uh, hopefully Mingus Union will be welcoming back their girls soccer program this year. We'll get an update on that at some point, but uh, look, it's going to be a fun year coach. I'm excited to hear you got 13 to 14 players on the varsity team, not including of course, who you'll be welcoming in as uh, tryouts continue as the off season comes to an end. November 30th, first game on the road for the bears at Dysert should be a fun one. I would quickly though, like to thank all my guests for coming on the show this week, Bob, Weir talking some rodeo and wrestling with him, Bradshaw mountain high school boys, golf coach, Dave Kapka want to, Congratulate Coach Kapka also taking over the softball program uh, later this year. But uh, And again, Coach Sterling, thank you very much for coming back onto the show and talking about these Bears. We're excited for the start of soccer season and can't wait to touch base with you again a little later on in the season. Thank you for having me, sir. I'm always welcome to come on and talk about my program. Promote it. Yes, sir. Any Anytime. Uh, that's why I'm here. Yes, sir. And anytime we appreciate it. Uh, that's going to do it for this episode of Off the Bench. All I'd right. like to thank you. Uh, have, have a great rest of your week. We'll talk to you next time.